not going to waste a whole lot of time. Uh, you guys know the routine. Uh, if you believe in the work we do, show some love, show some support. Look in the description box. Uh, pick a link. Pick uh, a path of support and give. Uh, the work we do is necessary. I'm not going to get off into it. Uh, if you followed us uh, over the years, you know what we do. Uh, if not, there are plenty of links in that box to take you to things we've done and we're doing. Uh, on that note, um, real brief, I'm actually uh, doing a late workout today. So I'm on my way to the gym. Uh, so I don't have a whole lot of time. And I want to talk to you about something that is on my mind. You know, there are so many different things we put our hands on at the Odyssey Project. Uh, the Black Voice, the teachers, uh, just a few of the things that I have been uh, instrumental in bringing to the forefront, along with partners like Dr. Michael Blanchard, uh, All Black News with the ODR, uh, the Black Voice uh, with uh, Michael Jordan, uh, and all of it is around bringing illumination uh, to the many ills, uh, challenges, enigmas, and problems that we face as a community. Um, one of the things that I am going to be putting, shedding a heavy light on is the systematic way that we are being divided uh, as a race along the lines of gender and how it's being done um, and the effectiveness of the systemic uh, encroachment upon uh, our collectivism. We're going to talk about that, but that's not why I'm here today. Why I'm here today is a young black brother by the name of Ralph Yarl, Y-A-R-L, out of Kansas, uh, Kansas City, Kansas. And this 16-year-old black man was sent by his parents to pick up his two siblings, uh, I guess who were visiting a friend or whatever, and he made the mistake of ringing the wrong doorbell. He was shot through the door. That, that shot hit him in the head. Um, he fell to the ground. The person opened the door and then shot him again while he was laying on the ground. He was able to jump up. How, I don't know. Uh, I'm just giving you the facts that I've been able to gather. He was able to jump up, run to a neighbor's house and uh, ask for help. 911 came out. He was in critical condition, obviously. Uh, unbelievably and uh, thankfully, he survived. He was actually released from the hospital on yesterday. He's at home recovering. Slow process, but he, he's alive and recovering. Here's the problem, and the problem is multifold. I'm gonna deal with the issue that's in my craw the most because I expect old white people to do what that old white man did, uh, and I expect the system to respond to it the way it did. So let's talk about the problem that I have. You've heard me say this so many times that it ought to just be an automatic when you see me come on that. If there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. Our greatest uh, problem isn't racism. Our greatest problem is the in instruments within the collective that racism uses to keep us at bay. To give the semblance of progress and the semblance of winning and actually taking L after L after L and when I talk about that, I'm talking about Lee Merritt, Ben Crump. And everybody said, man, those brothers, they get they get those families paid. Let me tell you something. Take all the hoopla away. Take away the fact that the average person has never seen, the average black person has never seen a million dollars. But keep in mind that the average white person hasn't either. Not all in one collective walk like that. So keep that in mind but understandably so when you're dealing with the people who collectively uh, flow uh, uh, you know a few thousand dollars above the poverty line you can understand what it seems like when the 
families offer three million dollars, five million dollars uh, as a settlement for the loss of their loved ones. But when you remove that veneer back, what you are really looking at is trading black lives for money. Uh, now, often this is done uh, when through police shootings and civil issues where the city is equipped with insurance to pay for this. Now, this is a ho white homeowner, so I'm almost certain they have homeowner's insurance that does cover if somebody is injured uh, through negligence or direct uh, intent for harm on their property. So there is access to funds or these brothers wouldn't have shown up. And I'm talking about Merritt and Crump. Here's my problem. My problem isn't in them getting multi-million dollar settlements for black families. I'm going to tell you what my problem is, and I'm going to tell you why the money that they're getting isn't the solution. Now, don't get me wrong. If you harm somebody, you should pay. This isn't about saying don't take the money. So let's get that argument and bullshit out of the way. This isn't what this is about. This is about understanding how and, and why it's detrimental to the long-term battle of leveling the playing field, the long-term battle of eradicating this type of systemic problem. Here's why. Anytime you settle, especially for that amount of money, there are some terms within this settlement that limit what the family can say after they accept it. So there's a non-disclosure, uh, you know, uh, basically a gag order that's within the settlement that literally basically says if they speak negatively about this or if they speak out, if they uh, reveal facts that have not yet been revealed to the public, that they could actually uh, not only lose, uh, I mean, be, end up having to pay that money back, they can be countersued. Okay, so what that means is in a regular civil trial, which this is with Ben Crump and Lee Merritt, what would happen is if you take it to trial is you get to dispose the witnesses. You get to have uh, full disclosure. You get all of this evidence brought out. Now you have it on record as being part of the case. It can now be referred to in developing ideas of how the system works. But when you sit up and you are actually saying we're going to settle, no deposition, nothing on record, no uh, discovery, all the things that put all the evidence on deck that can be put in as part of the record, we don't get to that. So what happens is... full disclosure when you settle so you leave you get a family paid but you leave the collective with nothing to fight with now lawyers are getting somewhere around 30 percent 33 if i'm not mistaken percent of the money being collected so they're lining their pockets again this isn't about not paying lawyers you work you do your you do what you're supposed to do you get paid that's the going rate. That's not cheap, nobody. That's the going rate when you solve civil cases, whether it's injury, uh, wrongful death, anything like that, 33%. So, my, but what I'm saying is, it's become a big business for both sides, and everybody seems to win, but we keep losing. Understand what I'm saying? We keep losing because we are left without anything to fight with, without the things that we can put on record that actually serve as proof and evidence that not only are our civil rights being violated, but our humanity is being violated. We're talking human rights as much as we're talking civil rights. And I think it is immensely important that we gain an understanding of that and what's at stake here. And they will keep sending people like Crump 
and merit at us and trying to sell us on the fact that we're winning because we're getting these major settlements. Now, keep in mind, in these settlements, the family is getting this money. Uh, but the family isn't getting anything along the lines of the right proper education, money management tools, and all the things that will help them take that money and actually, if nothing else, advance their family, put their family in a situation. What normally happens when people who haven't had money get money is they tend to mismanage money and it ends up right back in the hands of those that paid them. Uh, this has been one of the biggest problems that we've had. It happens with our athletes. It happens with our celebrities. It happens with lottery winners. If you don't understand how money works, if your relationship, and I talked about this earlier on Money Monday, if your relationship with money is skewed to the point where all you see it is as a tool to buy something, that's all you're going to ever do with it. You're not going to see it as a means of creating long-term uh, financial uh, independence and financial freedom because that's not how you view money. You view money as a means of paying bills and acquiring things. And so that's the only thing you're focused on. And so no matter what you do, if you don't have the right training, if you don't have the right exposure to the right people who can set you in the right direction, these are the things that should be set up for those families That so that Five years from now, we can look up and say, man, they took that five million, they turned it into 25 million, 30 million. They've sent their children to school. They've acquired property. They've set up companies. They set up trusts. All of these things are things that they should be doing. Okay. But my problem is that we keep allowing these guys to come in and we keep treating them like heroes. I've reached out to both, especially Ben Crump and presented cases that didn't have a whole lot of money and I couldn't even get his cronies involved. You know, the people that handle the, the, the low end stuff because the, 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 the bucks weren't there. So it's not about the people, it's about the money. I ain't had a problem with a person about their money. If you're about your money, be about your money, but don't be about your money under the guise that you're about the people because you, when you say you're about the people, people are looking at the way you behave and think that's the way people who are about the people are supposed to do. And that's not. I said it yesterday that I, you know, what I do, I serve my, my people, but I'm not indentured to them. And so, so I understand the, the idea that I have a right to ask to be paid for something. But if that's all I'm in it for, then I don't want to be seen as a warrior for black empowerment. I want to see be seen as a businessman. No problem with that for those who want to do that. I have taken on so many cases, so many situations, and fought on so many different fronts. That's not even in my area of expertise because I love my people. I have been knocked to my knees because I love my people. I've had targets put on my back because I love my people. I have watched friends get killed because we love our people. I'm literally talking about a real war where, 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 where half the people don't even realize this shit is going on. So when I see somebody that's just out there collecting a check, everybody's winning. Uh, the people responsible for the death are getting to sweep it under the rug like it never happened. And, and, and their insurance companies are paying these large payouts. Then the lawyers are winning. The families are thinking they're winning. But you're trading. Um, there's no, not. That's not a. That's not a family member. That I would trade for five million dollars, and some of my family members I don't even talk to. Not one of them I would trade. That, when you start trading lives like that, you start d d diminishing value because now what you're saying is that a black life that has been completely slaughtered and innocent and done a certain way is only worth five million. What is the life that it didn't happen that way? What, what, how do we start diminishing the value based on how they died? How do you start diminishing the bad value based on how well they did in school? We are always qualifying our, our victims. You know, the, the, the a student and never been in trouble. I don't give a fuck how much trouble you've been in. Did he do something to get his head blown off? Those are the things we've got to sit up and understand. We got to stop qualifying. We got to stop doing a whole bunch of stuff. Now on to this guy who shot him. Because of the law in, in, in that state, once you arrest a person, you have 24 hours to charge him or you have to release him. And because he was taken into custody, 
they had to release him after 24 hours, but there's an ongoing investigation. Now, he's an 80-year-old, so you know what they're saying. He's an 80-year-old. He made a mistake. He was afraid for his life. So, black guy rings your doorbell. He has to be up to something no good. Now, if you see this kid, nothing intimidating about this kid at all. This kid is slightly a slight build in, uh, in stature. Uh, nothing intimidating about him. Nothing overimposing. He's just black. So this guy saw a threat because this kid rung his doorbell. Didn't beat on the door, rung the fucking doorbell. And he shot him through the door. Now they're saying there may be a problem in charging him because the state has a stand your ground law. Well, my thing is, I don't think any stand your ground law should uh, involve shooting someone through a door. I think stand your ground means they have to actually have come in through your house or at the very minimum fire a shot through your door so now you know their intent and you know they're trying to harm you and you're returning fire now if they make it into your house uninvited all bets are off and i don't care who it is i'm not defending nobody that kicks somebody door in and go in and get that work no matter how badly i feel for you you gotta make good decisions but if I'm standing on your door and I ring your doorbell and you shoot me with the intent to kill me and for great, better, for good measure while I'm on the ground, you shoot me again. I don't give a damn how old you are. You're old enough to hold that gun. You're old enough to be held responsible. I mean, if you're in, uh, if your mind is good enough to hold that gun, you, your mind is good enough to be held responsible. I don't want to hear jack shit about he's old and he really didn't know what he was doing. He shouldn't have that gun. Um, so if he is allowed to shoot, he's allowed to be held accountable for the conditions under which he shot and that's it and that needs to be across the board so with that being said i'm not buying none of the bs we got to stay on top of this but we're going to start having to hold these ambulance chasers and these coffin chasers uh accountable uh for doing more than just getting a paycheck and we need to be aware of what's going on so that we can help families after they do this so that they are better off five years from now and that it hasn't been ciphered back out of them because they didn't know what to do with it. That's our responsibility as well. But I had to talk about this. I had to get this out. And on that note, look, I'm going to get off and I will talk to you guys later. I'm going to get this gym, get this work in. Uh, but I'll be checking in on you guys later. I think I got more to talk about. Uh, but on that note, I'm out. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.